Chapter Twelve of the Law and Medical Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The Law and Medical Men by Robert Vashon Rogers. Chapter Twelve. Chapter Twelve. Dissection and Resurrection. A knowledge of the causes and nature of sundry diseases which affect the human body, and of the best methods of treating and curing such diseases, and of healing and repairing divers wounds and injuries to which the human frame is liable, cannot be acquired without the aid of anatomical examination. So saith the preamble to the British Anatomy Act of 1832. The chief hindrances to the pursuit of the study of anatomy have arisen from ignorance and superstition. A prejudice has prevailed in all nations against the violation of the human body after death. Even now, only philosophers like Jeremy Bentham are willing to have their bodies dissected by their friends. Simple association of thoughts causes the remains of a dead kinsman or friend to be treated with respect and tenderness. In the same way, the horror of death attaching to anything connected with dead and the religious idea that the soul outlives the body, and continues in a ghostly way to retain a connection with its old habitation of clay, have led to the respectful disposal of the corpse among most nations. The Ptolemy princes Philadelphus and Ugertes, who enabled their physicians to dissect the human body, and prevented the prejudices of ignorance and superstition from compromising the welfare of the human race from far in advance of their times. Long after their day, the Koran denounced as unclean the person who touched a corpse, and the rules of Islamism still forbid dissection. The old Moslem doctors only found opportunities of studying the bones of the human body in the cemeteries. Not until the days of Henry the Eighth did the law make any provision for the cultivation and practice of the art of dissection. In 1540, more perhaps to strike terror into malefactors than from any enlightened notion of forwarding knowledge, the legislator gave permission to the masters of the mystery of barbers and surgeons of London to take annually four persons put to death for felony for anatomies, and to make incision of the same dead bodies, or otherwise to order the same, after their discretions, at their pleasure, for further insight and better knowledge, instruction, insight, learning, and experience, in the science or faculty of surgery. Elizabeth, in 1565, made a similar grant to the College of Physicians, that they, observing all decent respect for human flesh, might dissect the four felons. The bodies of all murderers executed in London and Westminster were to be given to the surgeons to be dissected and anatomized. But the legal supply of human bodies for anatomical examination still continued insufficient fully to provide the means of knowledge, and in order to furnish the necessary subjects, divers great and grievous crimes and murders were committed, the money paid being incentive. So, in 1832, the Anatomy Act was passed. This act proves clearly that Parliament regarded anatomy as a legal practice, and it provides for the licensing of those practicing anatomy, allows any executor or other person having lawful possession of any dead person, and not being an undertaker, etc., to hand over the body for dissection, respect, however, being had to the wishes of the deceased or his known relatives. Inspectorships of schools of anatomy were likewise established. In Canada, the bodies of convicts who died in the penitentiary, if unclaimed by the relatives, may be delivered to the professors of anatomy in any medical college or to an inspector of anatomy. The first defender of the faith, Henry the Eighth, the illustrious Elizabeth of most famous memory, and the enlightened James, had several statutes passed in which the disinterring of the dead is mentioned, but they were chiefly enactments against witchcraft, conjuration, the use of dead men's bones, and all sorts of sorceries. The Parliament of James solemnly enacted that if any person should consult, covenant with, entertain, employ, feed, or reward any evil and wicked spirit 
to or for any intent or purpose or take up any dead man woman or child out of his or her or their grave or any other place where the dead body rested or the skin bone or any other part of any dead person to be employed or used in any manner of witchcraft sorcery charm or enchantment every such offender his aiders abettors and counsellors should suffer death as felons and should lose the privilege and benefit of clergy and sanctuary this philosophical enactment graced the statute books until the ninth year of george the second while these statutes against sorcery were in force and the judges still imbued with the superstitious spirit of the age the presumption was very strong that bodies disinterred were removed for purposes of enchantment or witchcraft and resurrection men and students of anatomy as their aiders and abettors were in imminent jeopardy of suffering as felons but as the belief in sorcery grew weaker the prospect of these men grew brighter and they were relieved from the great danger that they ran under the laws of constantine a woman could without blame repudiate her husband if he was guilty of violating the tombs of the dead and we are told that the ostrogoths allowed divorce for the same reason and among the franks one who took the clothing from a buried corpse was banished from society and none could relieve his wants until the relations of the deceased consented as long ago as the tenth year of james i at the assizes in leicester a man was tried for stealing winding sheets sir edward coke tells the matter thus one william hayne had in the night digged up the graves of divers and several men and of one woman and took the winding sheets from the bodies and buried the bodies again and i advising hereupon for the rareness of the case consulted with the judges at sergeant's inn on fleet street when we all resolved that the property of the sheets was in the executors administrators or other owners of them for the dead body is not capable of any property and the property of the sheets must be in somebody and according to this resolution he was indicted of felony in the next assizes but the jury found it but petty larceny for which he was whipped as he well deserved these learned people thought that if a winding sheet had been gratuitously furnished by a friend the property remained in the donor for quoth they the winding sheet must be the property of somebody a dead body being but a lump of earth hath no capacity also it is no gift to the person but bestowed on the body for the reverence toward it to express the hope of the resurrection also a man cannot relinquish the property which he hath to his goods unless they be vested in another subsequently lawyers have generally concurred in these opinions the coffin too is the property of the personal representative of the deceased a still more interesting question arises as to who owns the corpse it has been generally held that there is no property in it blackstone remarks that although the heir has property in the monuments or escutions of his ancestor he has none in his body or ashes according to the law of england after the death of a man his executors have the right to the possession and custody of the body although they have no property in it until it is properly buried a man cannot dispose of his body by will or any other instrument a contract for the sale of a corpse even to doctors will not be enforced it cannot be made an article of merchandise the relatives have the right of interring the body and when this right is once exercised they have no further interest in it than to protect it from injury in indiana the courts have diverged somewhat from the beaten track and held that the surviving relatives are entitled to the corpse in the order of inheritance as property and that they have a right to dispose of it as such subject to whatever burial regulations are reasonable and proper for the public health and advantage the english anatomy act as has been seen gives the executor or other person having the lawful possession of the body of any deceased person power to permit it to be anatomically examined in england the earlier writers on criminal law say nothing of the taking of a body from the grave except that it is not theft east however calls it a great misdemeanor and there have been several convictions for this as an offence at common law doubtless the belief that it was an offence at common law was nearly connected with the idea of the bodies being used for the dark purpose of the necromancer and it would appear that no distinct authority upon the abstract has been found in ancient legal records
it is an indictable offence punishable with a fine and imprisonment or both and this even though the body has been taken in the interest of science and for the purpose of dissection or even if the motives of the offender were pious and laudable in lynn's case lynn was indicted for entering a burying ground taking a coffin up and carrying away a corpse for the purpose of dissection it was urged that the offence was cognizable only by the ecclesiastical courts but the judges of the king's bench said that common decency required that a stop should be put to the practice that it was an offence cognizable in a criminal court as being highly indecent and contra bonus mores at the bare idea alone of which nature revolted that the purpose of taking up a body for dissection did not make it less an indictable offence they refused to stay proceedings but inasmuch as lynn might have committed the deed merely through ignorance they only fined him five marks since then others have been more severely dealt with and in a very recent case stephen jay said the law to be collected from these authorities seems to me to be this the practice of anatomy is lawful though it may involve an unusual means of disposing of dead bodies and though it certainly shocks the feelings of many persons but to open a grave and disinter a dead body without authority is a misdemeanor even if it is done for laudable purposes it is also an indictable offence in many states to disinter a corpse unless the deceased in his lifetime had directed such a thing or his relatives consent to it and that the resurrecting is for the purpose of dissecting does not improve matters in new york removing dead bodies for the purpose of selling the same or from mere wantonness is punishable both by fine and imprisonment and in new hampshire and vermont such offences bring upon those convicted fines whipping and imprisonment as the court may see fit in massachusetts unclaimed dead bodies and those of persons killed in duels or capitally executed are assigned to the medical schools of the state the new york act of seventeen eighty nine must be considered as the first american anatomy law the first section prohibits the removal of dead bodies for dissection the second section permits the courts in passing capital sentence to award the body to the surgeons for dissection enactments similar to that of the new york act section one have been passed by the following states alabama arkansas california connecticut georgia illinois indiana iowa kansas kentucky maine massachusetts michigan minnesota mississippi missouri nebraska new hampshire ohio oregon pennsylvania rhode island tennessee texas vermont virginia west virginia and wisconsin the second section of the new york act has developed into the acts of twenty-four states which have thus legalized dissection and most of them have made specific provisions for the dissection of the bodies of certain deceased criminals chiefly murderers these states are alabama arkansas california colorado connecticut georgia illinois indiana iowa kansas maine massachusetts michigan minnesota missouri nebraska new hampshire new jersey new york ohio pennsylvania tennessee vermont and wisconsin some of these states have made no other provision for anatomical study beyond that mentioned we have already referred to the canadian act on this subject in addition the ontario act provides that the bodies of persons found dead publicly exposed or who at time of death have been supported in and by some institution receiving government aid except lunatics in provincial assignments shall unless the person so dying otherwise direct or the bona fide friends or relations claim it be given to public medical schools in the locality or to public teachers of anatomy or surgery or private medical practitioners having three or more pupils for whose instruction such bodies are actually required such medical practitioners must give security for the decent interment of the bodies after they have served their purposes and then a written authority to open a dissecting room is given by the inspector of anatomy of the city town or place the inspector's duty is to keep a register of bodies given up for dissection a register of the qualified practitioners desiring bodies to make an impartial distribution of the bodies in rotation to visit the dissection rooms and report to the police magistrate or chief municipal officer any improper conduct on the part of students or teachers 
a person may be found guilty of the offence of disinterring a corpse even though he was not actually present at the body lifting if with the intention of giving aid and assistance he was near enough to afford it if required besides the danger he runs of being brought before a criminal tribunal the body lifter incurs the risk of civil proceedings being taken against him it is true as blackstone says the heir has no property in the body or ashes of his ancestors nor can he bring any civil action against such as indecently at least if not impiously violate and disturb their remains when dead and buried but that learned commentator goes on to remark the person indeed who has the freehold of the soil may bring an action of trespass against such as dig and disturb it this has been clearly established in the case in massachusetts where a father sued for the removal of the remains of his child and recovered a verdict for eight hundred thirty seven dollars in an action of trespass quar clausum frigit mr justice forster in giving judgment remarks that a dead body is not the subject of property and after burial it becomes part of the ground to which it has been committed earth to earth dust to dust ashes to ashes the only action that can be brought is trespass quare clausum any one said the judge in actual possession of the land may maintain this against the wrongdoer the gist of the action is the breaking and entering but the circumstances which accompany and give character to the trespass may always be shown either in aggravation or mitigation acts of gross carelessness as well as those of wilful mischief often inflict a serious wound to the feelings when the injury done to property is comparatively trifling and we know of no rule of law which requires the mental suffering of a party complaining caused by the misconduct of the wrongdoer to be disregarded wilcock in his laws relating to the medical profession in his tenth chapter when considering the lawfulness or unlawfulness of taking bodies for the purpose of dissection says the whole question must depend upon the proper answer to these inquiries is it a violation of property is it a personal injury to any individual or is it an injury to the public every lawyer who has mentioned the subject has admitted that there is no violation of property in respect of the corpse itself which is necessary to constitute the removal of an offence and blackstone has distinctly stated that the only property violated is the grass and soil of the land wherein the body was interred in respect of which the person may bring his action of trespass and the law has not provided any punishment as for an offence it is equally clear that it is not an injury to any person for the shrewd lawyers of coke's time determined that the body was no person but a lump of clay and the only injury which can give a right of action to that is which amounts to a violation of any legal right of a relative or master is such as may be said to recoil upon him by causing him expense labor or loss of valuable service the unpleasantness which may arise from an attack upon prejudices however intimately blended with good feeling and delicacy of sentiment is ranked by the court with that class of wrongs which are technically designated damna absque injuria in lynn's case the judges assumed to answer the third question that is to assert that it is an injury to the public society is not injured by the disinterment of the dead for the purposes of science for it could hardly exist without such a sacrifice of fastidiousness society is not insulted by the secret abstraction of the corpse from the vermin which crowd to pollute it and they who so curiously seek the remains of those they hold dear behind the veil of science would do well to pry for one moment into the secrets of the sepulchre they alone are the violators of every sentiment of delicacy and benevolence who insult the disconsolate relatives with the tale of the robbery and the pursuit and with the foul spectacle of dismemberment they may have length discovered it would appear that in a proper case the court in the interests of justice will compel the exhuming and examination of a dead body which is under the control of a plaintiff if there is a strong reason to believe that without such examination a fraud is likely to be accomplished and the defendant has exhausted every other method known to the law of exposing it however such an order should be made only upon a strong showing to that effect it would be a proceeding repugnant to the best feelings of our nature and likely to be in many cases so abhorrent to the sensibilities of the surviving relatives that they would prefer an abandonment of the suit to a compliance of the order 
thus spake the court in a case where the order for exhuming was asked for and refused as not being justified under the circumstances the action was on a policy of insurance and the defence was that the insured had falsely warranted that he had never received any serious personal injury whereas his skull had been fractured in boyhood and he had been healed by trephining to prove this the company proposed to disinter his body after the suit had been pending eighteen months upon the sole testimony of his physician that the deceased had said that he had been told of such an accident and operation the counsel for the plaintiff called the proposal revolting and said that to break the signet of the grave and take from its resting place the sacred property of relatives to gratify the corporation's mercenary curiosity would be worse than shylock's demand End of chapter 12。section 13 of the law and medical men。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by ian stewart。rosanna victoria australia。the law and medical men by robert vachon rogers section thirteen chapter thirteen dentists the need of dentists existed long before dentistry the preacher knew of the inconveniences which arise when the grinders are few marcellus about b c three eighty gave two receipts for toothache one is say argidam margidam sturgidam the other is spit in a frog's mouth and request him to make off with the complaint these are given in glenn's laws affecting medical men in england in the tenth and eleventh centuries priests and monks were the dentists of the day afterwards a decree of the council of tours having forbade clergymen undertaking or engaging in any bloody operation all surgical practice fell into the hands of blacksmiths and barbers the latter soon became the more important class and in fourteen sixty one as we have seen already edward the fourth incorporated them as the freemen of the mystery or faculty of surgery by degrees other persons assumed to practise pure surgery and these two bodies in fifteen sixty were united by act of parliament and became the masters or governors of the mystery and commonalty of the barbers and surgeons of london by the third section of this act because of fear of the spread of contagious diseases any one in the city of london using barbary or shaving was forbidden to occupy any surgery letting of blood or any other thing belonging to surgery drawing of teeth only excepted in those days one wishing to find a drawer of teeth had to resort to one of those shops where was exhibited the bandaged pole as a sign or symbol that all the king's liege people there passing by might know at all times whither to resort in time of necessity something more than a sign is now required of dental surgeons the royal college of surgeons in england has now the power to appoint examiners for testing the fitness of persons to practise as dentists and to grant certificates of such fitness to become a licentiate of dental surgery in england it is necessary to be engaged for four years in the acquirement of professional knowledge to attend at a recognized school one course of lectures at least in anatomy physiology surgery medicine chemistry and materia medica and a second course on the anatomy of the head and neck one course on metallurgy and two on dental surgery and anatomy dental physiology and mechanics to have dissected for nine months to have taken a course of chemical manipulation to have attended a hospital for two or more sessions and to have spent three years in acquiring practical familiarity in mechanical dentistry under a competent practitioner and then to pass the examination required by the board in ontario the royal college of dental surgeons has power to appoint a board of directors who have authority to fix the curriculum of studies to be pursued by students to determine the period during which they must be employed under a practitioner to appoint the examiners and arrange the examinations for those who desire to obtain a license to practice dental surgery in the province 
the board may also confer the title of master of dental surgery upon any licentiate who passes certain examinations and conforms with certain regulations the college is composed of all those entitled to practice in the province and no one who is not a member of the college can practice dentistry for hire gain or hope of reward or pretend to hold or take or use any name title addition or description implying that he holds a license to practice or that he is a member of the college or shall falsely represent or use any title representing that he is a graduate of any dental college under a penalty of twenty dollars and costs for every offence to be recovered in a summary way before a magistrate or in a division court by suit persons contravening the act cannot recover for work done or materials provided of course the act does not interfere with legally qualified medical practitioners dentists are subject to the same rules as to negligence as are physicians or surgeons and if by a culpable want of attention and care or by the absence of a competent degree of skill and knowledge a dds causes injury to a patient he is liable to a civil action for damages unless indeed such injury be the immediate result of intervening negligence on the part of the patient himself or unless such patient has by his own carelessness directly conduced to the injury the law is ever reasonable so it only requires of a dentist a reasonable degree of care and skill in his professional operations and will not hold him answerable for injuries arising from his want of the highest attainments in his profession the rule is that the least amount of skill with which a fair proportion of the practitioners of a given locality are endowed is the criterion by which to judge of the professional man's ability or skill as far as the liability is concerned no distinction is made between those who are regular practitioners and those who are not so the latter are equally bound with the former to have and to employ competent skill and attention a patient must exercise ordinary care and prudence so that if one tells the dentist to pull out a tooth but does not say which one is to go and the wrong one is taken out the sufferer has no legal ground of complaint unless indeed it is quite apparent which is the offending member a patient may have been a little careless and negligent still if the dentist has been so very neglectful of his duty that no ordinary care on the part of the patient would have prevented the mistake or injury complained of the injured party will recover that is recover damages for the injury received the fact that one has taken chloroform will not affect his rights or remedies against the tooth puller for any mistake or negligence the maxim vigilantibus non somnientibus jura subveniunt has no reference to people put to sleep by anaesthetics in new york two dentists undertook to extract a tooth from a patient while the latter was under the influence of laughing gas during the operation the forceps slipped and part of the tooth went down the patient's throat causing coughing and vomiting for four weeks when in a fit of coughing the tooth came out and relief followed the patient sued for damages and when the case came before it the court said the defendants the dentists knew that the plaintiff the patient while under the influence of the anaesthetic had no control of his faculties that they were powerless to act and that he was unable to exert the slightest effort to protect himself from any of the probable or possible consequences of the operation which they had undertaken to perform he was in their charge and under their control to such an extent that they were required to exercise the highest professional skill and diligence to avoid every possible danger for the law imposes duties upon men according to the circumstances in which they are called to act in this case skill and diligence must be considered as indissolubly associated the professional man no matter how skilful who leaves an essential link wanting or a danger unguarded in the continuous chain of treatment is guilty of negligence and if the omission results in injury to the patient the practitioner is answerable the quantum of evidence necessary to make out a prima facie case of negligence is very slight in some cases while in others a more strict proof is required often the injury itself affords sufficient prima facie evidence of negligence there was evidence offered by the plaintiff showing that while the defendant drew the tooth the forceps slipped this fact combined with the unusual circumstance that the tooth went down instead of coming up 
was sufficient to carry this case to the jury upon the question of negligence. The trial judge held that, while the affirmative was upon the plaintiff to prove negligence, the fact that the defendants, instead of taking the plaintiff's tooth out, let it go down his throat, was sufficient evidence to carry the question of negligence to the jury, to the end that they might determine whether, in the light of all the circumstances, the defendants had exercised the skill and care which the exigencies of the case required. This ruling was correct. Boyle's case is an interesting one on the subject of the use of chloroform. He was a streetcar driver. A vicious horse, by a kick, threw him from his platform, so that he hit his head against a tree box. He was picked up insensible and carried into a surgery. This he was enabled to leave in a couple of hours, and the following day went to work again. In course of time he had a toothache, and went to a Dr. Winslow's to have it extracted, intending to take chloroform. The chloroform was administered, but did not operate as soon as usual, exciting rather than tranquilizing B. Insensibility, however, having been finally obtained, the teeth were taken out, the doctor giving the anaesthetic from time to time during the operation, as symptoms of returning consciousness appeared. Boyle walked home shortly afterwards, feeling, however, dizzy and being uncertain in his gait. These unpleasant symptoms continued even after reaching his house. The next day, thickness of speech and numbness of one arm and side came on, with partial paralysis. From this he was still suffering when a jury was called upon to say whether his state was due to the neglect of the dentist or not. The judge told the jury that, even if they doubted the safety of the agent employed, chloroform, there was still a consideration of the highest reason which they ought not to disregard. He remarked, all science is the result of a voyage of exploration, and the science of medicine can hardly be said to have yet reached the shore. Men must be guided, therefore, by what is probably true, and are not responsible for their ignorance of the absolute truth which is not known. If a medical practitioner resorts to the acknowledged proper sources of information, if he sits at the feet of masters of high reputation and does as they have taught him, he has done his duty and should not be made answerable for the evils that may result from errors in the instruction which he has received. He who acts according to the best known authority is a skilful practitioner, although that authority should lead him in some respects wrong. If the plaintiff was from previous circumstances predisposed to paralysis, it might well happen that the extraction of his teeth without the chloroform, or the use of the chloroform without the extraction, would bring on a paralytic attack. Even if this was the case, still it would not be just to make the defendants answerable for consequences which he could not foresee, which were not the ordinary or probable result of what he did. He was only bound to look to what was natural and probable, to what might reasonably be anticipated. Unless such guard is thrown around the physician, his judgment may be clouded, or his confidence shaken by the dread of responsibility at those critical moments when it is all important that he should retain the free and undisturbed enjoyment of his faculties, in order to use them for the benefit of his patient. In the olden time, front teeth were considered very valuable. Our ancestors appear to have used them in fighting, and the hurting of a man so as to render him less able in fighting to defend himself or annoy his adversary was considered a misdemeanour of the highest kind, and spoken of by my Lord Coke as the greatest offence under felony. To cut off an ear or strike off a nose was nothing to the knocking out of a foretooth, for a nose or an ear is useless in a fight. Doubtless they are in the way." According to that system of punishment introduced into England by the Ingalls, which compensated every injury by money payment, a front tooth was valued highly, and one who deprived another of such a member had to pay six shillings, while breaking a rib only cost half as much, and shattering a thigh only twelve shillings. The fact that a dentist extracts teeth for love and not for money does not relieve him of his liability for failure to perform his work properly. And if one is foolish enough to allow an ignorant apprentice to practice on his teeth, he can still recover from the dentist for any injuries. It is a good answer to an action brought by a dentist to recover payment for his work and labour that the defendant has been injured instead of benefited by the plaintiff's treatment, either because of his want of skill or his negligence. So when Mr. Gilpin went to Mr. Wainwright to have a tooth extracted, 
and Wainwright gave him chloroform and then pulled out the wrong tooth, and Gilpin declined to pay for the performance, alleging a want of consideration, the dentist sued for his account, but the court gave judgment against him. If the dentist's bill had been increased owing to his own mistake or wrongdoing, as where being employed to pull out one tooth and insert a false one, he pulled out two, and so had to put in two, he cannot recover for this additional amount of work. Lord Kenyon well put this when he said, If a man is sent for to extract a thorn which might be pulled out with a pair of nippers, and through his misconduct it becomes necessary to amputate the limb, shall it be said that he may come into a court of justice to recover fee for the cure of the wound which he himself has caused? To put the question is to give the answer. In fact, in such a case as the one put, it would appear that not only could no recovery be had for the additional services rendered necessary by the dentist's own want of proper care, but the man whose grinders were thus made few would be entitled to a further deduction from the bill for the bodily suffering and damage he had sustained. One cannot reasonably expect to have teeth as well fitted to the mouth by art as nature. Mrs. Henry got a set of artificial ones from Dr. Simons. When put into her mouth, she complained that they felt odd and pained her. The plate was somewhat filed, but she was still dissatisfied and declined to pay the bill. It was then agreed that she should take them away and try them for a day or two. This was done, and again she returned them, declining to pay. The doctor then sued, and the evidence as to whether the teeth fitted was conflicting. One testified that they were a good piece of work, another that they were a fair average piece of work, while a third said they were nothing extra. The judge instructed the jury that if Simons had used all the knowledge and skill to which the art had at that time advanced, that would be all that could be required of him. The verdict was for the defendant. On an application for a new trial, the court considered the instructions erroneous and granted a new trial, saying that surgeons are held responsible for injuries resulting from a want of ordinary care and skill. The highest degree of skill is not to be expected, nor can it reasonably be required of all. The instruction given was undoubtedly correct, and no more would be required of him. But upon legal principles, could so much be required of him? We think not. If it could, then every professional man would be bound to possess the highest attainment, and to exercise the greatest skill in his profession. Such a requirement would be unreasonable. It is a dangerous thing for both parties for the dentist to try a new instrument or a new modus operandi for the first time. Doing so, the court once said, was a rash act, and he who acts rashly acts ignorantly. Using a new instrument is acting contrary to the known rule and usage of the profession. One cannot become an experimentalist except at his own peril. A dentist, at a lady's request, prepared a model of her mouth and made two sets of artificial teeth for her. In response to a letter notifying her that they were ready and asking when he could come and put them in, the dentist received the following note. My dear sir, I regret, after your kind effort to oblige me, my health will prevent my taking advantage of the early day. I fear I may not be able for some days. Yours, etc., Francis P. Very shortly, the lady died. The dentist sued her executors for £21, but he failed to recover. The court held that a contract to make a set of teeth is a contract for the sale of goods, wares, or merchandise within the meaning of the 17th section of the Statute of Frauds, and that, as by the terms of the contract, the teeth were to be fitted to the lady's mouth, and as this, through no default on her part, was never done, her executors were not liable to the dentist for work done and materials provided nor was the letter a sufficient memorandum within the meaning of the act referred to. Counsel for the plaintiff and the court seem to differ widely in their opinions of the artistic nature of tooth-making, the former arguing that the deceased had in truth contracted for the skill of the dentist, and that the materials were merely auxiliary to the work and labour, said this case was not to be distinguished from that of an artist employed to paint a picture. The ivory used was of insignificant value as compared to the skill employed. Judge Crompton, however, said, Here the subject matter of the contract was the supply of goods. The case bears a strong resemblance to that of a tailor supplying a coat. The measurement of the mouth and the fitting of the teeth being analogous to the measurement and fitting of the garment. A similar view of the standing of a dentist was taken by the court in Michigan, when it was held that he was a mechanic. 
the court observed a dentist in one sense is a professional man but in another sense his calling is mainly mechanical and the tools which he employs are used in mechanical operations indeed dentistry was formerly purely mechanical and instruction in it scarcely went beyond manual dexterity in the use of tools and a knowledge of the human system generally and of the diseases which might affect the teeth and render an operation important was by no means considered necessary of late however as the physiology of the human system has become better understood and the relations of the various parts and their mutual dependence become more clearly recognized dentistry has made great progress as a science and its practitioners claim with much justice to be classed among the learned professions it is nevertheless true that the operations of the dentist are for the most part mechanical and so far as tools are employed they are purely so and we could not exclude these tools from the exemption which the statute makes without confining the construction of the statute within limits not justified by the words employed on the other hand in mississippi the court said a dentist cannot be properly denominated a mechanic it is true that the practice of his art requires the use of instruments for manual operations and that much of it consists in manual operations but it also involves a knowledge of the physiology of the teeth which cannot be acquired but by a proper course of study and this is taught by learned treatises upon the subject and as a distinct though limited part of the medical art in institutions established for the purpose it requires both science and skill and if such persons should be included in the denomination of mechanics because their pursuit require the use of mechanical instruments and skill in manual operation the same reason would include general surgeons under the same denomination because the practice of their profession depends in a great degree upon similar instruments and operative skill nor could such a pursuit properly be said to be a trade false teeth have been considered necessaries for a wife one andrews had a conversation with gilman a dentist as to the latter furnishing the former's wife with a plate of mineral teeth and he agreed to pay for certain other dental services rendered to mrs a the plate was furnished while mr and mrs a were living together and it was quite suitable to the former's circumstances and station in life he saw it knew whence it came raised no objection to it still he declined to pay for it the court however held him liable not only because the wife being permitted to retain the plate and the other circumstances showed her authority to make the purchase but also on the ground that the teeth were some of those necessaries wherewith a husband is bound to furnish his wife a dentist must not take any unfair advantage of his patient some thirty years ago one captain simpson a very old seaman and a pensioner in greenwich hospital gave a bill of exchange payable eight months after date for two hundred and sixty two pounds ten shillings to one davis a london dentist purporting to be for value received davis said the real bargain was that he should during the whole of the captain's life attend to his teeth and supply him with new ones from time to time he also said that a new set of teeth would cost from thirty pounds to fifty pounds the bill was in the handwriting of d it was given in his house when no third person was by and it was never heard of until after the captain's death which took place before it was due there was no writing as to the teeth the executors of simpson declined to pay whereupon davis handed the note over to a creditor of his own who sued both parties the executors filed a bill in chancery impeaching the document for fraud and asking that it might be delivered up to them the court thought it was quite impossible for any reasonable being to draw any inference from the materials before it but that it was a case of fraud nay a gross fraud and the decree was made as asked sir launcelot shadwell thought that the case had points of resemblance to that of dent and bennett in which a medical man bargained for a very large sum of money to attend a person of advanced years until death but in that case the doctor had to attend to the whole human body not merely to a particular part of it one dentist must not imitate too closely the sign or card of a fellow practitioner one colton alleged that he had purchased from a dr g q colton the right to use the name colton dental association in connection with the use of nitrous oxide gas to alleviate pain in the extraction of teeth and that he used the same in advertisements and prominently displayed it on signs that the defendant who had been in his employment left him 
opened dental rooms in the same street, issued cards announcing that he was formerly operator at the Colton Dental Rooms, and extracted teeth without pain by the use of nitrous oxide gas, and put up a sign to the same purport over his door. But the words formerly operator at the upon cards and sign were in small and almost illegible letters, while the words Colton Dental Rooms were very conspicuous. The signs were very similar in shape, size, etc., and were hung on the same side of the street in the same manner, and might readily be mistaken the one for the other, especially by suffering patients impatient for relief. An injunction against the defendant's cards and signs was granted. And where Morgan and Schuyler, two dentists, dissolved partnership, S. bought M.'s interest in the fixtures and in the lease of the room and continued business therein. M. removed his name from the sign, but S. replaced it and put above, in letters so small as to be nearly imperceptible, his own name with the words successor to. The agreement of dissolution did not prohibit M. from engaging in the business, so he opened an office, therefore, in another part of the city. He then applied to the court to restrain his late partner from the use of his name as mentioned. He was successful in his action, but the court thought that S. would have kept within his rights if he had merely described himself as late of the firm. End of section 13. Recording by Ian Stewart, Rosanna, Victoria, Australia. Chapter 14 of The Law and Medical Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. The Law and Medical Men by Robert Vachon Rogers. Chapter 14. Druggists. A druggist, the Supreme Court of Louisiana says, means one who sells drugs without compounding or preparing them, and so is a more limited term than apothecary. A commission merchant dealing principally in alcohol is not a druggist, within the meaning of the Massachusetts Act, regulating the sale of alcohol by druggists, and although whiskey may be sold by druggists in comparatively small quantities as medicine, and doubtless a great many people so take it, Still, it was held that fifty barrels of whiskey remaining in a bonded warehouse at the time of his death would not pass under the will of a wholesale and retail druggist bequeathing his stock of medical drugs, etc. The court considered fifty barrels of whiskey wholly disproportionate to the ordinary stock of medicine and drugs kept on hand by the testator. Too much sack for the bread. One may be an apothecary or druggist, although he does not actually compound his medicines. In the early days in England, the grocers or potticaries, who formed one of the trade guilds of London, united with their ordinary business the sale of such ointments, simples, and medicinal compounds as were then in use. In the days of Henry the Eighth, the medical department of the grocers' trade being greatly increased, shops were established for the exclusive sale of drugs and medicinal and all kinds of chemical preparations. We have a graphic description of one of these apothecaries about the days of good Queen Bess in the words of the Prince of English Dramatists. I do remember an apothecary, and hereabouts he dwells, which late I noticed in tattered weeds with overwhelming brows, culling of simples. Meagre were his looks, sharp misery had worn him to the bones, and in his needy shop a tortoise hung, an alligator stuffed and other skins of ill-shaped fishes, and about his shelves a beggarly account of empty boxes, green earthen pots, bladders and musty seeds, remnants of pack-thread and old cakes of roses were thinly scattered to make up a show. Romeo and Juliet, Act Five, Scene One. Until 1868, any person whatever might open what is called a chemist shop in England and deal in drugs and poisons. In that year, however, the Pharmacy Act was passed, which prohibits any person engaging in the business of, or assuming the title of, chemist and druggist, or dispensing chemicals or drugs, unless he be registered under that Act. And to be registered, one must pass an examination in Latin, English, arithmetic, prescriptions, practical dispensing, pharmacy, materia medica, botany, and chemistry. Under the Ontario Act, there is a College of Pharmacy, managed by a pharmaceutical council, 
who grant certificates of competency to practice as pharmaceutical chemists, prescribe the subjects on which candidates are to be examined, and arrange for the registration of chemists. No one, save those registered or their employees, is authorized to compound prescriptions of legally authorized medical practitioners. The Act, however, does not apply to medical practitioners. But save as aforesaid, no one can retail, dispense, or compound poisons, or sell certain articles named, or assume or use the title of chemist and druggist, or chemist, or druggist, or pharmacist or apothecary, or dispensing chemist or druggist, unless he has complied with the Act. The Code Napoleon recognizes two classes of vendors of drugs and medicines, apothecaries and druggists. The former, who are assumed to be pharmaceutically educated, are alone allowed to sell compounded medicine. The latter, who are classed with grocers, are only permitted to sell drugs of a simple character in bulk and at wholesale. In the United States, wherever statutes do not otherwise direct, apothecaries and druggists are put upon the common law footing of provision vendors, and may sell in any quantities articles in which they deal. A druggist is held to a strict accountability in law for any mistake he may make in compounding medicine or selling his drugs. By the statute law of England, it is declared to be the duty of every person using or exercising the art or mystery of an apothecary to prepare with exactness and to dispense such medicines as may be directed for the sick by any physician. And by the same act, for the further protection, security, and benefit of George the Third's subjects, it was declared that if any one using the art or mystery of an apothecary should deliberately or negligently, unfaithfully, fraudulently, or unduly make, mix, prepare, or sell any medicines, as directed by any prescription signed by any licensed physician, such apothecary shall, on conviction before a justice of the peace, unless good cause be shown to the contrary, forfeit for the first offence five pounds, for second ten pounds, and for third he shall forfeit his certificate. But apart from any statute, whenever a druggist or apothecary, using the words in their general sense, sells a medicine, he impliedly warrants the good quality of the drugs sold. And besides that, he warrants that it is the article that is required and that is compounded in every prescription dispensed by him, secundum artem. Like the provision dealer, the pharmaceutist is bound to know that the goods he sells are sound, i.e. competent to perform the mission required of them, and being so presumed to know, he warrants their good qualities by the very act of selling them for such. The rule, let the buyer beware, does not apply. In some way, Fleet and Simple got cantharides mixed with some snake root and Peruvian bark. Unfortunately, Hollenbeck, requiring some of this latter mixture, bought this that these druggists had, took it as a medicine, and in consequence suffered great pain, and had his health permanently impaired. He sued for damages, and recovered a verdict of $1,140. The defendants asked for a new trial, but the court refused it, saying, Purchasers have to trust a druggist. It is upon his skill and prudence they must rely. It is his duty to know the properties of his drugs, to be able to distinguish them from one another. It is his duty so to qualify himself, or to employ those who are so qualified, to attend to the business of compounding and vending medicines and drugs, as that one drug may not be sold for another, and so that, when a prescription is presented to be made up, the proper medicine, and none other, be used in mixing and compounding it. The legal maxim should be reversed. Instead of caveat emptor, it should be caveat venditor, i.e., let him be certain that he does not sell to a purchaser or send to a patient one thing for another as arsenic for calomel, cantharides for or mixed with snake root and Peruvian bark, or even one innocent drug calculated to produce a certain effect, in place of another sent for and designed to produce a different effect. If he does these things, he cannot escape civil responsibility upon the alleged pretext that it was an accidental or an innocent mistake. We are asked by the defendant's attorneys in their argument, with some emphasis, if druggists are in legal estimation to be regarded as insurers. The answer is, we see no good reason why a vendor of drugs should in his business be entitled to a relaxation of the rule which applies to vendors of provisions, which is, that the vendor undertakes and ensures that the article is wholesome. 
the general customer is not supposed to be skilled in the matter of drugs but in the purchase he must rely upon the druggist to furnish the article called for and in this particular business the customer who has not the experience and learning necessary to a proper vending of drugs will not be held to the rule that he must examine for himself it would be but idle mockery for the customer to make the examination when it would avail him nothing on the contrary the business is such that in the very nature of things the druggist must be held to warrant that he will deliver the drug called for and purchased by the customer it is the duty of the druggist to know whether his drugs are sound or not and it is no answer to his want of knowledge to say that the buyer had opportunities for inspection and could judge for himself of the quality of goods if a druggist miscompounds a medicine or intentionally deviates from the formula he commits a tortious act and if any injury arises to another through his ignorance or neglect he is liable even if a physician writes a prescription wrongly it is expected that the druggist will know enough to detect the error and whether he does so or not he still compounds it at his peril for one man's negligence or omission of duty is no palliation of another's and under the doctrine of joint liability the apothecary or druggist who compounds knowingly or not a noxious prescription commits a joint tort with the physician who writes it and in an action against a druggist for injury through the negligence of his clerk in selling sulphate of zinc for epsom salts it is no defence to say that the subsequent medical treatment was negligent a wholesale druggist is liable in the same way as a retail when he supplies substances notoriously dangerous to life or health and he impliedly warrants the articles to be as represented by their conventional designation and if they are not so he is liable for all damages that may ensue from his misrepresentation if a druggist affixes to a medicine or drug a label bearing his name and stating it to have been prepared by him he makes the warrant only more notorious and by so doing inasmuch as it is an invitation to the public to confide in his representation is ever after a stopped from denying responsibility for any injury which may have arisen out of defects in its quality or errors in its composition so long as the label is attached it is an affirmation of the good quality of the article and its correct composition to everyone who relies upon it when buying but as some articles deteriorate in time what is said in relation to the liability of the vendor applies only to the article at the time it leaves his hands he only warrants its good qualities then but no longer and his representation affirms that much and no more the subject of labels was carefully considered in thomas v winchester where ruggles c j gave judgment mary ann thomas was ordered a dose of extract of dandelion her husband bought what he believed was dandelion from dr ford druggist and physician but it was extract of belladonna the jar was labeled half pound dandelion prepared by a gilbert number 108 john street new york ford bought it as dandelion from james s aspinwall druggist who bought it from defendant a druggist 108 john street defendant manufactured some drugs and purchased others but labeled all in the same way gilbert was an assistant who had originally owned the business the extract in the jar had been purchased from another dealer the two extracts are alike in color consistency smell and taste gilbert's labels were paid for by the defendant and used in his business with his knowledge and consent a non-suit was moved for on the ground that the defendant being a remote vendor and there being no privity or connection between him and the plaintiff the action could not be sustained the court said gilbert the defendant's agent would have been punishable for manslaughter if mrs thomas had died in consequence of taking the falsely labeled medicine every one who by his culpable negligence causes the death of another although without intent to kill is guilty of manslaughter this rule applies not only where the death of one is occasioned by the neglectful act of another but where it is caused by the neglectful omission of a duty by that other although the defendant w may not be answerable criminally for the neglect of his agent there can be no doubt as to his liability in a civil action in which the action of the agent is to be regarded as the act of the principal the defendant's neglect put human life in imminent danger can it be said that there was no duty on the part of the defendant to avoid the creation of that danger by the exercise of greater caution 
or that the exercise of that caution was a duty only to his immediate vendee whose life was not endangered, he being a dealer and not a customer. The defendant's duty arose out of the nature of his business, and the danger to others incident to its mismanagement. Nothing but mischief like that which actually happened could have been expected from sending the poison falsely labeled into the market, and the defendant is justly responsible for the probable consequences of the act. The duty of exercising caution in this respect did not arise out of the defendant's contract of sale to Aspinwall. The wrong done by the defendant was in putting the poison unlabeled into the hands of Aspinwall as an article of merchandise to be sold, and afterwards used, as the extract of dandelion, by some person then unknown. The defendant's contract of sale to Aspinwall does not excuse the wrong done the plaintiffs. It was part of the means by which the wrong was effected. The plaintiff's injury and their remedy would have stood on the same principle if the defendant had given the belladonna to Dr. Ford without price, or if he had put it in his shop without his knowledge, under circumstances that would have led to its sale on the faith of the labels. Ordrano says, section 186, It cannot be denied that had Mrs. Thomas died, Ford would, equally with Gilbert, have been guilty of manslaughter, since whether he intended it or no, he was doing an unlawful act in dispensing a poison for a salutary medicine. Well, then, it may be proper enough to rely upon labels and warranties of others in dealing with ordinary substances. Still, when it comes to articles of a character dangerous to health or life, the law will presume knowledge of their quality in those professionally dealing in them, and exact a degree of skill and care commensurate with the risks incurred. Here it is caveat venditur instead of caveat emptor. In Kentucky, a druggist sold croton oil instead of linseed oil for a patient who, in consequence of the mistake, died. His widow was held entitled to full damages against the seller. If a druggist negligently sell a poison as and for a harmless medicine to A, who buys it to administer to B, and gives B a dose of it as a medicine, from the effect of which he dies, a right of action against the druggist survives to B's representative, notwithstanding the want of privity of contract between B and the druggist. And this is the rule also when the sale has been made by the apothecary's assistant. Joseph George, and Emma, his wife, sued Skyvington, a druggist, alleging that he, in the course of his business, professed to sell a chemical compound made of ingredients known only to him, and by him represented to be fit for a hair wash, without causing injury to the person that used it, and to have been carefully compounded by him. That Joseph thereupon bought of the defendant a bottle of this hair wash, to be used by Emma, as the defendant knew, and on the terms that it could be so safely used, and had been so compounded, yet the defendant had so negligently and unskillfully conducted himself in preparing and selling the hair wash, that it was unfit to be used for washing the hair, whereby the plaintiff Emma, who used it for that purpose, was injured. The court held that a good cause of action was shown. A Massachusetts apothecary sold sulphide of antimony by mistake for black oxide of manganese. The two look alike, but differ in this, that the preparation of manganese may be safely mixed with chlorate of potassia for many useful purposes. But if that antimony is mixed with that chlorate, an explosive compound is formed. The buyer, supposing he had manganese, proceeded to mix it with potassia, having bought the article for that purpose. But, it being antimony, the compound which he made exploded, broke his head, damaged his hearing, and destroyed the furniture of his laboratory. Yet the court held that the druggist was not chargeable with these damages, because he did not know that the article he sold was to be mixed with potassia, and did not sell it for that purpose. Kept or used by itself, as he sold it, it would have been innocuous. He was not to blame for the mixing, the real cause of the injury. In England, a chemist and druggist was indicted for manslaughter, but was acquitted. The deceased had been in the constant habit of getting aconite and occasionally henbane from Noakes. On this occasion he sent two bottles of his own, one marked henbane, thirty drops at a time. The druggist by mistake put the aconite into the henbane bottle. The dose of thirty drops was taken, and the customer was no more. Earl C.J., 
told the jury that although there might be evidence of negligence sufficient for a civil action, still that they could not convict unless there was such a degree of complete negligence as the law meant by the word felonious, and that in this case he did not think there was sufficient to warrant that. But Tessimond, a chemist's apprentice, was found guilty of manslaughter for causing the death of an infant by negligently giving to a customer who asked for paragoric to give to the infant, a child of nine weeks old, a bottle with a paragoric label, but containing laudanum, and recommending a dose of ten drops. One Jones recovered against a chemist and druggist of the name of Fay one hundred pounds for damages, because he, Fay, gave him blue pills for the painter's colic, such physic being improper. A man, on the advice of a friend, went to a drug store for ten cents worth of black draught, a comparatively harmless drug, of which he intended to take a small glassful as a dose for diarrhoea. There was evidence given by the clerk who sold the mixture that at the shop he asked for black drops. The defendant, the proprietor, told him that that was poison, that the dose was from ten to twelve drops, and advised him to take another mixture. He refused, and the clerk, by the defendant's direction, gave him two drams of black drops in a bottle, with a label bearing those two words written upon it, but nothing to indicate the dose or that it was poison. The man took the bottle home, drank almost all its contents, and died the next morning from the effects of so doing. In an action brought by the representative of the deceased to recover damages for negligent killing by the defendant, it was held that the courts should have submitted to the jury the question as to whether the defendant was not guilty of negligence in failing to place upon the bottle a label showing that its contents were poisonous, and that it erred in non-suiting the plaintiff. Afterwards, in giving the judgment of the Court of Appeal, Finch, J., said, On such a state of facts, as sworn by the clerk, a verdict against the defendant would not be justified. Although no label marked poison was put upon the vial, and granting that by such omission the defendant was guilty of misdemeanor, and liable to the penalty of the criminal law, under the statute of the state, still that fact does not make him answerable to the customer injured, or to his representative in the case of his death, for either a negligent or wrongful act, when towards that customer he was guilty of neither, since he fairly and fully warned him of all and more than could have been made known by the authorized label. If the warning was in truth given, if the deceased was cautioned that the medicine sold was a strong poison, and but ten or twelve drops must be taken, he had all the knowledge and all the warning that the label could have given, and could not disregard it and then charge the consequences of his own negligent reckless act upon the seller of the poison. But if no such warning was given, its omission was negligence, for the results of which the vendor was liable both at common law and by force of the statute. But the court considered that the clerk being himself the one who had been negligent stood in a position to provoke suspicion, arouse doubt, and justify watchful and rigid criticism, and that this joined with the conduct of the deceased, developed a question of fact rather than of law, and that the court below was right in saying that the case should have been submitted to the jury. Under the Ontario Pharmacy Act, no one can sell certain poisons named without having the word poison and the name of the article distinctly labelled upon the package, and if this sale is by retail, the name of the proprietor of the establishment where it is sold, and the address, must also be on the label. Any person selling any poison, in violation of the Act, is liable to a penalty of not more than twenty dollars and costs for the first offence, and fifty dollars and costs for every subsequent offence, and one half the penalty goes to the prosecutor, and no one selling in violation of the Act can recover his charges. And one willfully or knowingly selling any article under pretense that it is a particular drug or medicine, when it is not, is liable to the above penalties besides any other to which he may be liable irrespective of the act. In Georgia it was held that where a druggist in good faith recommended the prescription of another person to the owner of a sick horse, who thereupon ordered him to put it up and paid for it, the owner had no cause of action because the medicine had injured his horse, as the stuff was properly prepared according to the prescription. In England, chemists and druggists are liable to the heavy penalty of five hundred pounds if they sell to brewers or dealers in beer anything to be used as a substitute for malt. 
they are also liable for adulterating or selling any adulterated medicine, and on a second offence of this kind, the name of the offender, his abode, and his crime may be published in the newspapers at his expense. An action can be maintained by a husband against a druggist to recover damages for selling to the plaintiff's wife, secretly, from day to day, large quantities of laudanum to be used by her as a beverage, and which are so used by her to the druggist's knowledge, without the knowledge or consent of the husband, the druggist well knowing that the same was injuring and impairing her health, and concealing the fact of such sales and the use thereof from the husband in consequence of which use by her, the wife became sick and emaciated, and her mind was affected, so that she was unable to perform her duties as such wife, and her affections became alienated from her husband, and he lost her society, and was compelled to expend diverse sums of money in medical and other attendance upon her. In some of the American courts, it has been held that a statute forbidding the sale, or keeping for sale without authority, of spirituous or intoxicating liquors does not apply to druggists who keep such liquors only for the purpose of mixing them with other ingredients, according to prescriptions of physicians, and also for the purpose of manufacturing such compounds as are commonly used by druggists to be sold as medicines for remedies for sickness and disease. The question has often come up whether a compound sold by a druggist is to be considered an intoxicating liquor, the sale of which is illegal or not. The rule laid down is that so long as liquors retain their characters as intoxicating liquors, capable of being used as beverages, notwithstanding that other ingredients, roots or tinctures, may have been mixed therewith, they fall under the ban of law. But when they are so compounded with other substances as to lose their distinctive characters of intoxicating liquors, they are no longer desirable for use as stimulating beverages, they are medicine, and their sale is not prohibited. In Indiana, a bona fide sale of intoxicating liquor by a druggist for medicinal purposes is not a violation of the statute regulating the sale of such liquors, although the statute contains no exception authorizing the sale of such liquors without license for medicinal, chemical, or sacramental purposes. And that is the law in North Carolina, but not in Arkansas. In Iowa, it was considered a breach of the law for a druggist to sell a quart of whiskey to a stranger upon his simple statement that he was accustomed to take it as a medicine, and wanted it as such. In Texas, where a druggist can only sell ardent spirits upon the prescription of physicians in sickness, a druggist who is himself a physician may sell to a sick patient without a prescription from anyone else. End of chapter 14「and assistance. A partnership between medical men is an association of persons standing to one another in the relation of principles for jointly carrying out the objects of their profession with an agreement to share the profits. The general laws relating to partnerships apply to those of medical men or dentists. There can be no partnership as between themselves, if the relationship of master and servant exists, or where there is no joint interest, no particular form of words is needed to create a partnership, nor need the agreement be in writing, unless it is to last for more than a year from the date. If an agreement to form a partnership is broken, an action will lie, if the terms of the agreement be clear and distinct but the performance of such an agreement will not be compelled unless all the terms have been fixed and ascertained and a definite time for its duration agreed on if one has been induced to enter the partnership through the fraud or misrepresentation of the other the party deceived may at his option avoid the contract 
but he should act promptly on discovering the deception where a surgeon was induced to enter into partnership with and pay a large premium to another in consequence of misrepresentations as to the amount of income derived from the practice a dissolution was decreed and a return of part of the premium and where a practitioner took a partner and a premium and agreed to continue practicing for three years concealing the fact that he was suffering from a disease which soon carried him off his executor was ordered to return part of the premium partners are trustees and agents for one another and must exercise the most perfect good faith towards one another one cannot sue the other for his share of the profits until the accounts have been stated and settled between them one medical man cannot as a rule bind his partner by borrowing money even to pay partnership liabilities or by making or drawing promissory notes or bills of exchange but he may generally do so by simple contracts within the scope of the business in england it appears that there is nothing illegal in the partnership of a qualified and an unqualified practitioner and that it will be sufficient if only one member of the firm be registered a partnership may be dissolved by mutual agreement or by the effluxion of time a wilful and permanent neglect of business is a ground for dissolution so is gross misconduct by a partner in reference to partnership matters immoral conduct materially affecting the business will be a ground for dissolution also insanity or permanent incapacity on a dissolution the partners may separately carry on the business at any place unless restrained by agreement sir john leach considered that in a partnership between professional persons upon the death of one partner the goodwill of the business belonged to the survivor and that he was not bound to account to the representatives of the deceased partner for it a good will attaches to a professional as well as to any other kind of business and it is and may be the subject of purchase and sale and although it is not computable and the sale of it is not enforceable by an action for specific performance if it has not been estimated yet it does stand on the same footing as any other business if the parties have fixed a determinate price upon it or have provided any other way of fixing its value the goodwill of a medical man's business is an asset of his estate which his representatives can sell and for which they must account if it is sold but it is not clear that the representatives can be compelled to find a purchaser jessel m r recently asked the question what is the meaning of selling a medical practice and in answering his query he said it is the selling of the introduction of the patience of the doctor who sells to the doctor who buys he has nothing to else to sell except the introduction he can persuade his patients probably who have confidence in him to employ the gentleman he introduces as being a qualified man and fit to undertake the cure of their maladies but that is all he can do therefore when you talk of the sale of a non-dispensing medical practice of course when a man keeps what is called a doctor's shop there is a different thing entirely to sell you are really talking of the sale of the introduction to the patients and the length the character and duration of the introduction the terms of the introduction are everything and there is something more according to my experience in cases of the sale of medical practices there is always a stipulation that the selling doctor shall retire from practice either altogether or within a given distance it is so always 
and there is also sometimes a stipulation that he will not solicit the patients or shall not solicit them for a given time they are both very important stipulations as regards keeping together the practice for the purchasing doctor the general rule of law is that any contract in general restraint of trade or industry is illegal and void as contrary to public policy but such contracts are valid if they operate merely as a partial restraint and are made for good consideration and not unreasonable whether they are reasonable or not is for the court not the jury to say a contract made with an assistant or with a partner that upon separating from the principal or partner he will not practice within a certain section of the country or for a certain time is valid when made in consideration of instruction to be given or pecuniary or other benefits to be enjoyed in consequence of the partnership the limits must be reasonable and when the contract is not to be practiced within so many miles of a certain place the distance will be measured as the crow flies unless otherwise mentioned covenants on the part of an assistant to a surgeon and apothecary not to practice on his own account for fourteen years in a certain town or within ten miles of the town and not at any time to practice within five seven ten twenty miles of a certain places have been all respectively held good the comparative populousness of the district forbidden ought not to enter into consideration at all and an assistant to a dentist was held bound by a covenant not to practice in london notwithstanding the city had a population of over a million but a stipulation not to practice within one hundred miles of york in consideration of receiving instruction in dentistry was held void a promise whether verbal or written made without good consideration by a medical man not to exercise or carry on his profession within certain limits is void the stipulations in a contract not to practice are divisible and if part of them be unreasonable and therefore illegal and void the agreement is not void altogether and the remaining stipulations if valid will not be affected by the illegality of the others the relations of medical men to their apprentices assistants and pupils are as a rule regulated by the ordinary law of master and servant no particular words are needed to create the relationship of master and apprentice or master and assistant the intention of the parties will be considered nor need the agreement be in writing unless it is not to be performed within a year from the making thereof a master is liable on contracts entered into by his apprentice or assistant when he has authorized him to enter into any such contract either expressly or by implication for instance if an assistant usually orders drugs on credit and the master usually pays the master will be held liable to pay for any goods of a similar nature which the assistant may get for his own and not his master's use the master is also as a rule liable to civil action for the wrongful acts of his assistant unless they be beyond the ordinary scope of his employment the plaintiff however must prove that the injury was produced by want of a proper skill where the act complained of is said to have arisen through want of skill but the master will not be criminally responsible for the acts of his assistant or apprentice if the latter has caused the death of any one unless indeed he has expressly commanded or taken part in the acts in case of criminal negligence 
the apprentice himself is responsible if a party is guilty of negligence and death results the party guilty of that negligence is also guilty of manslaughter an apprentice or pupil cannot be dismissed in as summary a way as an ordinary servant for misconduct in one case it was held that though a person has a right to dismiss a servant for misconduct still he has no right to turn away an apprentice because he misbehaves and that the case of a young man say of seventeen who under a written agreement is placed with a medical man as pupil and assistant with whom a premium is paid is a case between that of an apprenticeship and service and if such an one on some occasions comes home intoxicated this alone will not justify the surgeon in dismissing him but if the pupil and assistant by employing the shop-boy to compound the medicines occasions real danger to the surgeon's practice this will justify the surgeon in dismissing him pupils and others admitted to hear the lectures of medical men whether such lectures are delivered at tempore or from memory or from notes although they may go to the extent if they are able to do so of taking down the whole by means of shorthand can do so only for the purposes of their own information and cannot publish the lectures for profit without the consent of the lecturer end of chapter fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of the law and medical men by robert vashon rogers